Chapter 2 Concerning Alarm Clocks Now, where shall we put them? Dinner was over. Lady Court had been once more detailed for duty. Sir Oswald had unexpectedly come to the rescue by suggesting bridge. Not that suggesting is the right word. Sir Oswald, as became one of our captains of industry, number seven of series one, merely expressed a preference, and those around him hastened to accommodate themselves to the great man's wishes. Rupert Bateman and Sir Oswald were partners against Lady Coote and Gerald Wade, which was a very happy arrangement. Sir Oswald played bridge like he did everything else extremely well, and liked a partner to correspond. Bateman was as efficient a bridge player as he was a secretary. Both of them confined themselves strictly to the matter in hand, merely uttering in curt short barks, two no trumps, double, three spades. Lady Court and Gerald Wade were amiable and discursive, and the young man never failed to say at the conclusion of each hand, I say, partner, you played that simply splendidly, in terms of simple admiration which Lady Coot found both novel and extremely soothing. They also held very good cards. The others were supposed to be dancing to the wireless in the big ballroom. In reality, they were grouped around the door of Gerald Wade's bedroom, and the air was full of subdued giggles and the loud ticking of clocks. Under the bed in a row, suggested Jimmy, in answer to Bill's question. And what shall we set them at? What time, I mean? Altogether, so that there's one glorious whatnot, or at intervals. The point was hotly disputed. One party argued that for a champion sleeper like Jerry Wade, the combined ringing of eight alarm clocks was necessary. The other party argued in favour of steady and sustained effort. In the end, the latter won the day. The clocks were set to go off one after the other starting at 6.30 a.m. And I hope, said Bill virtuously, that this will be a lesson to him. Hear, hear, said Socks. The business of hiding the clocks was just being begun when there was a sudden alarm. Hist, cried Jimmy. Somebody's coming up the stairs. There was a panic. It's all right, said Jimmy. It's only Pongo. Taking advantage of being dummy, Mr. Bateman was going to his room for a handkerchief. He paused on his way, and took in the situation at a glance. He then made a comment, a simple and a practical one. He will hear them ticking when he goes off to bed. The conspirators looked at each other. "'What did I tell you?' said Jimmy in a reverent voice. "'Pongo always did have brains.' The brainy one passed on. It's true, admitted Ronnie Devereux, his hat on one side. Eight clocks all ticking at once do make a devil of a row. Even though Jerry, ass as he is, couldn't miss it, he'll guess something's up. I wonder if he is, said Jimmy Thesiger. Is what? Such an ass as we all think. Ronnie stared at him. We all know old Gerald, do we? said Jimmy. I've sometimes thought that, well, well, that it isn't possible for anyone to be quite the ass old Jerry makes himself out to be. They all stared at him. There was a serious look on Ronnie's face. Jimmy, he said, you've got brains. A second Pongo, said Bill encouragingly. Well, it just occurred to me, that's all, said Jimmy, defending himself. Oh, don't let's all be subtle, cried Socks. What are we to do about these clocks? Here's Pongo coming back again. Let's ask him, suggested Jimmy. Pongo, urged to bring his great brain to bear upon the matter, gave his decision. Wait till he's gone to bed and go to sleep. Then enter the room very quietly and put the clocks down on the floor. Little Pongo's right again, said Jimmy. On the word one, all park clocks, and then we'll go downstairs and disarm suspicion. Bridge was still proceeding, with a slight difference. Sir Oswald was now playing with his wife, 
and was conscientiously pointing out to her the mistake she had made during the play of each hand. Lady Court accepted reproof good-humouredly, and with a complete lack of any real interest. She reiterated, not once, but many times, I see, dear, it's so kind of you to tell me. And she continued to make exactly the same errors. At intervals, Gerald Wade said to Pongo, Well played, partner. Jolly well played. Bill Eversley was making calculations with Ronnie Devereux. Say he goes to bed about twelve. What do you think we ought to give him? About an hour? He yawned. Oh, curious thing. Three in the morning is my usual time for bye-bye. But tonight, that's because I know we've got to sit up a bit. I'd give anything to be a mother's boy and turn him right away. Everyone agreed that they felt the same. My dear Maria, raised the voice of Sir Oswald in mild irritation, I have told you over and over again not to hesitate when you are wondering whether to finesse or not. You give the whole table information. Lady Coot had a very good answer to this, namely that as Sir Oswald was dummy, he had no right to comment on the play of the hand. But she did not make it. Instead, she smiled kindly, leaned her ample chest well forward over the table, and gazed firmly into Gerald Wade's hand, where he sat on her right. Her anxieties lulled to rest by receiving the Queen. She played the knave, and took the trick, and proceeded to lay down her cards. Four tricks and the rubber, she announced. I think I was very lucky to get four tricks there. Lucky, murmured Gerald Wade, as he pushed back his chair and came over to the far side to join the others. Lucky, she calls it. That woman wants watching. Lady Court was gathering up notes and silver. I know I'm not a good player, she announced in a mournful tone, which nevertheless held an undercurrent of pleasure in it. But I'm really very lucky at the game. You'll never be a bridge player, Maria, said Sir Oswald. No, dear, said Lady Court. I know I shan't. You're always telling me so, and I do try so hard. She does, said Gerald Wade, sotto verse. There's no subterfuge about it. She'd put her head right down on your shoulder if she couldn't see into your hand any other way. I know you'll try, said Sir Oswald. It's just that you haven't any card sense. I know, dear, said Lady Coote. That's what you're always telling me. And you owe me another ten shillings, Oswald. Do I? Sir Oswald looked surprised. Yes, seventeen hundred, eight pounds ten. You've only given me eight pounds. Dear me, said Sir Oswald. My mistake. Lady Coote smiled at him sadly and took up the extra ten shilling note. She was very fond of her husband but she had no intention of allowing him to cheat her out of ten shillings. Sir Oswald moved over to a side table and became hospitable with whisky and soda. It was half past twelve when general good nights were said. Ronnie Devereux, who had the room next door to Gerald Wade's, was told off to report progress. At a quarter to two he crept around, tapping at doors. The party, pyjamaed and dressing gowned, assembled with various scuffles and giggles and low whispers. The light went out twenty minutes ago, reported Ronnie in a hoarse whisper. I thought he'd never put it out. I opened the door just now and peeped in and he seemed sound off. What about it? Once more the clocks were solemnly assembled. Then another difficulty arose. We, we, we can't all go barging in. Make no end for our. One person's got to do it, and the others can hand him the whatnots from the door. Hot discussion then arose as to the proper person to be selected. The three girls were rejected on the grounds that they would giggle. Bill Eversley was rejected on the grounds of his height, weight, and heavy tread, also for his general clumsiness, which latter clause he fiercely denied. Jimmy Thessiger and Ronnie Devereux were considered possibilities, but in the end an overwhelming majority decided in favour of Rupert Bateman. Pongo's the lad, 
agreed Jimmy. Anyway, he walks like a cat, always dead. And then if Jerry should waken up, Pongo will be able to think of some rotten silly thing to say to him. You know, something plausible that will calm him down and not rise his suspicions. Something subtle, suggested the girl's socks thoughtfully. Exactly, said Jimmy. Pongo performed his job neatly and efficiently. Cautiously opening the bedroom door, he disappeared into the darkness inside, bearing the two largest clocks. In a minute or two, he reappeared on the threshold, and two more were handed to him, and then again, twice more. Finally, he emerged. Everyone held their breath and listened. The rhythmical breathing of Gerald Wade could still be heard, but drowned, smothered, and buried beneath the triumphant, impassioned ticking of Mr. Murgatroyd's eight alarm clocks. Thank you.